Thank you very much, Stephen, for that introduction. Um, tax is not really my strong suit. I did do tax as a part of my original economics degree, and after three years of tax, I said, I'll never go there again. Um, but it is a necessary evil, and certainly in business, we're well aware of its implications. When we talk about tax reform, though, it's very important that we just don't zero straight in on tax reform. Who's going to pay? Who do we take the money off? Really, it's better and it's, I think, important that we step back and look at the whole issue of tax reform in the context of the economy and the budget. And we have to decide what are we seeking to achieve out of tax reform? Is it the overriding consideration, balancing the budget, getting somebody else to pay? Is it growing the economy and locking in long-term prosperity? My personal view is that the, the latter is the priority. Although, of course, balancing the budget is an important consideration. And if I just do a, a quick reprise on the, on the audit, the National Commission of Order, uh, we are proven that we're, what we said was correct, that we do have an expenditure problem. And 12 months on, that is demonstrated absolutely in the IGR and the latest budget. In our case, we focused on the 15 largest growing programs, usual offenders, age pension, aged care, health, hospitals, Medicare, uh, NDIS, uh, education. These are all growing far faster than the economy itself and far faster than any forward predictions of growth in the economy. We looked at other things, but federation, public service efficiency, grants, and bodies and what have you, yeah, sure, very important and needed, needs to be dealt with and can improve the efficiency and productivity of the federal government, but really will not be enough to fix the budget. And if I go back to uh, the Treasurer's speech when he was in opposition in London, uh, great speech on entitlement, that is the core issue, entitlement. The entitlement mentality now is almost ingrained in Australia. Over 50% of our population now gets some form of government payment from the Commonwealth Government. In real terms, over the last 40 years, uh, payments per head of population in Australia have grown from $6,000 to $16,000 per head in real terms. So that's gone up almost three times. Our report was based on reasonable assumptions. We were not optimistic or pessimistic, may have been a little bit optimistic in some things like terms of trade and inflation. We did allow for bracket creep, and I'll come back on that later, but uh, bracket creep, of course, is one way of slowly but inexorably killing off the incentive to work. We looked at, we were told to look at only at expenditure, but we couldn't help ourselves, and we looked at GST, family tax benefit, and superannuation tax concessions, and I'll come back on those. But coming back to my central theme, the government is confronted with a fiscal problem, a long-term fiscal problem, a short and long-term fiscal problem, which is not really going to get any better. And they have three levers to pull. One is the tax lever, another one is the expenditure lever, and the third one is to encourage and foster greater economic growth than we would otherwise get. And of course, again, the latter is the preferred option because not only do you grow the economy, generate more wealth and taxes, you grow more jobs, and you, you decrease the level of dependency of the individual by providing such employment. New Zealand decided, in their wisdom, to pull all three level levers simultaneously, and frankly, it's worked. It's worked. They increased the GST, the consumer consumption tax, they had economic reform, they had fiscal reform, and they're ahead of us on all the key, key performance indicators. Economic growth's higher, unemployment's lower, workforce participation's higher, budget's back in balance, and by a surprise, surprise, the government gets re-elected with an increased majority. So there are some limits from across the ditch. The latest budget, um, I think, is understandable in political terms, and of course, 
it has some modest fiscal reforms in the Senate and one of those seems to now to have been accepted by the Greens and I thought that was a great breakthrough and that's an indication of what the government has to do to get fiscal reform. But the, uh, the change in the, uh, in the, the entitlement rules for age pension I thought was a great breakthrough and again something that we had recommended. But if we just look at it in an expenditure sense, uh, by 1819 expenditure will rise to $49.4 billion on the projections in the forward estimates, which is 25.8% of GDP. Now, at the height of the GFC, at the height of the GFC, when the stimulus package was at its highest, it was 26% of GDP. So this is only 0.2% of GDP lower than the height of the stimulus package. So we do have an expenditure problem. And of course the budget is based on, I think, some reasonably optimistic assumptions regarding economic growth returning to trend, uh, Senate approval of these uh, uh, fiscal reforms and world growth continuing and our own growth not only continuing but growing a little bit more. So I pray they're correct. And I pray also that there's no further downturns in the global economy because if there are, we will find ourselves very exposed because we have no reserves. Unlike the GFC where we had plenty of reserve capacity, we don't. We've we fired off all our shot. So Australia is at a crossroads. The resources boom is nearly over, at least the the investment side of it is nearly over, the volumes are up, the prices are down, and we're seeing the Australian economy now for what it really is. The resources boom masked the real underlying economy in Australia for a number of years. We have low productivity growth, we are a high cost country, we have an ageing population, and business and consumer confidence haven't really recovered from the GFC. So I'd say we're just sort of we're not going backwards, but we're just sort of treading water at the moment in an economic sense. And as I said, the fiscal outlook is based on continuing and higher rates of growth. But turning to taxation, and we just quickly run through some of the things we did look at in the audit report. GST, my view and the view of the Commission, a no-brainer. Increase the rate, increase the base, give the extra money to the states and reduce uh, the tied grants from the Commonwealth to the states and let the states stand on their own two feet. And those states that are growing faster will get more GST and they need more revenue and they'll be in, it'll be a virtuous circle. But I, I just can't see how we can get by in terms of balancing the books in the future, sharing the tax burden fairly without an adjustment to the GST. Company tax, well we're high compared to many of our competitors. Uh, I think the company tax take in Australia is 5.2% of GDP. The OECD average is 3%. So, uh, you know, there's only country, one country, I think, Norway, which is ahead of us. Sweden, the poster child of the Social Democrats, is at 22%. UK is at 21%. UK is growing a bit quicker than us, by the way. Superannuation tax concession. I declare an interest. I'm one of them. I'm benefiting from this. I am definitely benefiting from it. But we concluded in, in our report that the idea of these concessions was to lift the rate of people who were self-dependent, who were self-funded retirees. But it's been stubbornly fixed at 20% for a, a long time. So those incentives do not appear to be working to encourage a growth in the coterie of um, self-funded retirees. So we, I, I agree that that should be looked at. It should be looked at in the context of the whole retirement income question, including age pension and what have you. And you'd need to be careful too on the incentive side that you don't, in fact, deplete the 20% that we've already got. But uh, it's definitely something that has to be reviewed and I believe that some of those concessions will have to be modified. Um, negative gearing. Again, it's another one of those taxes you've got to be careful. I mean, it's, you know, it's, we, it's a sort of a Sydney-centric thing, perhaps a Melbourne-centric thing, that we assume that residential property prices are going to increase forever all over the country and 
you know, uh, negative gear as they're going to make a huge capital gain at the expense of income tax in the, in the meantime. Well, yeah, that may be the case, but we have had downtowns before, before and this is not across the country. Far North Queensland, for example, you can buy a property there that uh, for the same price it was sold in 2005. So somebody negatively gearing up there has certainly been paying a pretty heavy price even though they've been getting a tax deduction. And I'm not sure what the impact would be on the, on the rental supply market because not all of Australians own or will own forever and so it could have a negative effect there. Uh, my own view on house pricing is that it's basic economics. If supply is constrained, demand's high, the price goes up. The real problem, and, uh, and the Commonwealth, I don't know why they sort of get too deeply involved in this, the real problem is at the state level, supply. Supply is the issue in the Sydney market, certainly. Melbourne is a little bit cheaper, the supply side of Melbourne is stronger. Uh, capital gains tax, I, I'm personally, and we didn't get into this in the Audit Commission, I'm personally in favour of bringing the CGT rate up to the income tax rate. I can't see any reason for treating it differently and I think it does in fact probably lead in some respects to a greater emphasis on negative gearing. I can't see any reason for treating capital gains any different from income ta gains. Uh, base erosion and profit sharing, well again I think you need to be careful. Um, obviously all companies making, uh, making sales and, and profits in Australia should pay their fair, fair rate of tax but it is very complex in an international environment and if you look at a company like Apple, they design in the United States, manufacture in China, sell here, where do you make the profit? Do you make it in China, do you make it in the US or do you make it here? You know, which jurisdiction gets the biggest share of the cake? Uh, maybe maybe America should get it. The best antidote, of course, to price share, uh, price uh, shifting and profit shifting is really have a competitive tax system. A competitive tax system is, in fact, the best antidote to profit shifting. So returning to our central theme of what exactly do we want out of tax reform? Do we want to balance the budget and pay for our extravagance? And that's the only word I can use to describe the current expenditure profile of the Commonwealth Government. Or grow the economy and provide for the future. And clearly, I mean, if you even went through this house, you'd, you'd say virtually everybody here would say the latter is the preferred option. I think we can make some tax changes, but these have got to be relatively modest unless we want to kill the economy. And we do certainly, in terms of our tax system, need to simplify it and rationalise it. And I, I, frankly, I don't know whether there's anybody in Australia that understands the complete tax act from you know, all its volumes from page one to the end. We do need, though, overarching, and this is what CEDAR is all about, a new economic reform agenda. We need to reduce entitlements. We need to reform labour markets to encourage flexibility and productivity. We're the only jurisdiction post the GFC that's re-regulated its labour market. We need to deregulate both at the federal and state level and to do that I think we will need to make incentive payments to the states. We need to invest more and more cleverly in training, and skills and education, particularly in STEM, and create jobs for the future or people trained for the jobs for the future. Innovation, broad term, covers a, a multitude of things but again the focus has got to be on innovation with a small country, with a small base and a small market, that's the only answer for us and that will cover things like tax and regulation, labour markets, training and skills. And all of these things when we review tax we should keep in the front of our mind. Before people say I'm being too negative I've got to say this is a great country. I'm not going to say we should whip ourselves to death. The ball is at our feet. We're well-educated people on the whole. We're healthy people on the whole. We're a very peaceful country and we are prosperous. But we've got to resist the temptation to blow it out of complacency or worse still selfishness and short-sightedness. So incremental and fair reforms across the board, including fiscal, tax and the economy, can set us up for the future 
and an even more prosperous future. Thank you.